Yeah, him more than me. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore Beeble. Of course, today the NBA lost its absolutely collective mind. Well, actually, it wasn't too bad, there was, but there was shit flying from every every single direction. And in general, 90% of the time, the trades that you uh, don't hear about are the ones that get made. We had heard rumors of some of those deals, or at least one of those deals going down. Uh, the others sort of uh, came pretty quickly. So what we're going to do in today's show, actually, we'll talk about that in a sec. Quickly, just going to plug the trade deadline, locked on trade deadline special. Myself, David Locke, the host of Locked On NBA and Locked On Jazz, of course, we will be hosting the trade deadline special. You can find it on my YouTube channel. That's easy to find through my Twitter links. Just go find my YouTube page. They will be going live at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. For those of you in Australia, Eastern Standard Time Australia, that's 5.30 a.m. on Friday morning. We'll be going live, running for 90-odd minutes or so as the trade deadline happens, talking about the deals that have gone down and the deals that do go down and the deals that perhaps perhaps didn't go down with uh, hosts right across the networks. That's going to be a very important show for you guys to listen to. And we break it all down as it happens live real world and fantasy impact of all of those deals for today's show. I am not going to be doing any DFS action for today because pretty simple, whatever I say now, we could have 30 guys traded by the deadline tomorrow and then everything changes. So there's no point in me going through each game meticulously when we just, there's going to be so many guys in and out of lineups. All this will be updated over on Basketball Monster, and you can check out all the issues, all the value plays, all the selections over on Basketball Monster, basketballmonster.com. But there's absolutely zero point in me doing a DFS preview on uh, for Thursday's games, considering that you could have 30 blokes pulled out of games. Maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration, but you know, 15 to 20 guys pulled out and value popping up all over the place. So what I say really doesn't end up making any difference on that sort of a show. So what we're doing today is we're going through and doing what we normally do by looking at Wednesday's game. Michael Bolton, he's patiently waiting in the wings here. And we're also going to talk about the trades that went down. Mick, let's get to it. To it. What a great idea. Michael Bolton, he is pumped. He is ready to go. He is awake, even though we're recording this a little bit late. Let's go to the first one. Monstrous line of the night. You are going to be sit down for a sec because the monstrous line of the night is James Harden of the Houston Rockets. 36 with six rebounds, eight triples, one assist, two steals, and a block. Uh, I wish I kept records of this, but I didn't. Someone I know does, maybe Bazza, you've got this. But I, I feel like Harden has got the monstrous line of the night in every game he's played for about the last five or six games. I'd be absolutely uh, astounded to work out how many monstrouses he has got and how many in a row he has got in the games that he's played. He has been fantastic. I really don't need to talk too much about Harden. He's doing it with Chris Paul. He's doing it without Chris Paul. He is going to be almost assuredly the number one player when all is said and done at the end of this season for fantasy basketball. He's the number one guy now. He's been the number one guy, and he's putting up historic numbers. You know that because I talk about him every single day on this show, so no need for me to keep talking about Jim Harden. The uh, I guess the upshot is he's bloody good. Next up. Waiver wire line of the, the night. The waiver wire line of the night. It is also Young Gun of the Night. And it's Josh Jackson of the Phoenix Suns. Now, Jackson has shown yeah, much improvement over the last six weeks to two months, especially in games that Devin Booker sits in. He took over today. 38 minutes, 27 points, four rebounds, seven assists, and five steals. That's the appeal of Jackson, is the steals, the assist numbers there. 56% shooting. 80% from the line on 10 attempts. They're pipe dream type numbers. He's not this sort of a shooter. He's shooting 41.6% from the field so far this season, 29% from three, and 67% from the line. So you take this game and you go, shit, that was good, but I also don't expect it. But to be fair to Joshy, over the last month, 44% from the field, 71% from the line, still just 26% from three, which is dreadful. And, and uh, you know, it's about the same that he was last year where he shot 26%. But those other numbers starting to push up. And over the last month, the 101st ranked player, 30 minutes a game, TJ Warren has been out. 
That's boosted Jackson's value, no doubt. There's a trade that the Suns did today with Tyler Johnson, which could complicate things here with Josh Jackson. But I think he is a worthwhile guy to be grabbing in 12 team leagues. I've been saying this for a while as well. I think they will start to phase TJ Warren out a little bit and push him into a smaller role, which they absolutely should be doing despite how well Warren trying to get that out, despite how well Warren has been playing. Today's been a disaster of a day, and I expect tomorrow will be the same, if not worse. Um, yeah, so Jackson is worth taking a flyer on. In most cases, uh, again, always depending on who you drop, but he's had a real spike in usage and efficiency has gone up as well. So good on Joshy for being able to turn around what was looking like a, a real poor, so well, not was looking like, it was actually a really poor start to his NBA career. The deep leaguer of the night is Gerald Green of the Houston Rockets. I don't need to talk much about Green here. 25 points in 29 minutes with four triples, two steals, and two blocks, but he has a massive chance of not even being a part of the rotation next game. You've got him, Jim Ennis, and Austin Rivers, who all played 28 minutes in this game, and somebody is going to lose out. This was a smacking of the... Um, of the Kings, so there is a, a chance that uh, you know the, the elevated or well, there are elevated minutes here because of that smacking. But with the arrival of Iman Shumpert, one of these guys is going to lose significant minutes. Um, we just don't know which one of them at this point, but it is it is worth noting. I, I think it most likely will be Gerald Green that's out of the rotation, despite how well he played in today's game. Um, but he's always, if he is in the rotation, he's always that three point streamer, uh, especially for deeper leagues. The dud of the night. I tell a man's not hot. I've been mentioning this for a while as well. I'm worried about uh, Willie Cauley Stein. Um, only 22 minutes here, no fouls as well. He's just playing poorly. Three points, six rebounds, two assists, and of course, no steals and no blocks, as is his wanton right. One of five from the field, one of four from the free throw line. He couldn't have been any worse, really. Well, he could have got fewer rebounds. He is the 118th ranked player this season. 141st over the last two weeks, and 253rd over the last three games. Now, that's a really small sample size, but what is important that he's playing one fewer minute per game, actually almost two fewer minutes per game over the last month. He's blocking absolutely no shots at all. He's blocked 31 shots in 54 games, which for a center is, is a disgraceful number. He's poor on your free throws. We are looking at, and in 12 hours' time, this is going to be a reality, value opening up in many spots. Corley Stein is rostered in like 84% of leagues on Yahoo!, I think he's droppable. In 10-team leagues, he is he is definitely droppable. Um, in 12-team leagues, I think it's trending absolutely in the wrong direction, especially with the moves the Kings made today. And I'm not so sure that they are actually finished. They'd like to get a bit more of the Sticky Bandits, uh, Marvin uh, Marvin Bagley and Harold, Harry Giles playing together as well. I think that instead of 30 minutes, pushing back to 30 minutes for Corley Stein, that it actually goes down to 26 or so. And that's really going to have an impact on his value. So I think that he is that guy that if you're looking to pull the trigger on someone who's on the wire due to value opening up at yeah, the trade deadline, I wouldn't be too bothered about losing Corley Stein. In fact, someone actually, if you drop him, someone then might go and add him and they might drop a better player, giving you a double win in that scenario. So it is worth worth noting and worth mentioning. The Goats of the Night, the best net rating, Ursan Ilyasova killed the Wizards, plus 140.2, while the worst net rating, woof, uh, Lonnie Walker the fourth in his first extended action was really bad. Negative 101.3 as the Spurs got their asses kicked. A really undermanned Spurs team. Walker struggled. He wasn't a guy that I was massively into, and by massively into, I did not like him really at all as a draft pick or as a fantasy prospect, especially for this season, but even moving forward. And he struggled here. Again, it, it, it's way too early to give any sort of definitive prognosis on what he's going to do, but just to suffice to say, I had him as a, as a significantly worse player than, say, Colin Sexton or, or Kevin Knox, but similar poor fantasy profiles and we saw you know, some real struggles from Big Lon today. Now let's get into the uh, the major bullshit of today and that is trades. Just trades, 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 trades. At the end of yesterday's show, Adrian Wojnarowski, I was getting in the car, I was heading off to my to my girlfriend's place, uh, driving out and then my phone just blows up. I go, fucking Woj, what are you doing? Tobias Harris gets traded. So I did a short little periscope. I recorded a full 20-minute podcast on that trade this morning, as well as the Thon McCare Stan Johnson deal. So we talked about that uh, this morning. So not covering that there. And then I finished that podcast this morning, and about five minutes later, we got the first trade. And then it was just a constant barrage of just trade after trade. On a, and I said this the other day as well, I think I tweeted out that the last couple of years, the two days before the deadline, we've had one or two, two deals go down. Tobias Harris was involved in a couple of those, uh, I think two of those deals when he went from Orlando to Detroit and Detroit to the Clippers. There's been these trades, but nothing like this, where we had six significant trades go down within the last 12 hours. 
Um, who knows? What's, it, it is absolutely shaping up to be a wild, wild trade deadline. So let's go through these deals that actually did go down. The first one, the Phoenix Suns, they made a move to get Tyler Johnson. Now, I worry about any time the Suns make a move, they got Tyler Johnson and Wayne Ellington in exchange for Ryan Anderson. Tyler Johnson is owed $19 million for next season. Ryan Anderson would have been owed 21, but he also had a guarantee, which was brought down to 15 million. So in essence, and I've seen a lot of Suns, uh, it's always, when, when I tweet something negative about a team and someone you know, puts back some sort of uh, rationale behind it, it's always a person who's supporting that team, always, without, without fail. Um, and oh, yeah, we're only paying $4 million for, Ty, for Tyler Johnson to play for us. And that's true, because you would have paid $15 million to waive Ryan Anderson, and now you can get Tyler Johnson. But why? Like, what purpose is Tyler Johnson serving on this team? He's going to be 27 by the time next season starts, so he's not old, but he's not young. He comes in, he takes minutes away from DeAnthony Melton, Ali Okobo, Josh Jackson. Um, he's not a point guard, and if they have designs on him being a point guard, they are wrong. He's a shooting guard. He doesn't average, he doesn't get assists. He's okay defensively. He's, he can shoot okay at times. He's just a mediocre sixth or seventh man type of player that you add to a team who is looking to be competitive and the Suns aren't. So I don't understand the move at all from them. Again, you can say that we're only paying $4 million for him to play next season. That's fine. You could have just waived Ryan Anderson. You could have used Ryan Anderson in another sort of deal, much like the Zach Randolph expiring deal was used by the Kings today to actually get a player who is significantly better despite his uh, yeah, foibles of himself, the pencil Harrison Barnes. So I didn't really understand this for Tyler. Now, I don't know what Phoenix is going to do. Do they see him as their point guard of the future? That's a disturbing thought if they think that. But is he the guy that's going to pair with Devin Booker? I don't know. He's had one season where he's really been a top 100 guy, and even then he was barely that player. Um, he he um, doesn't get assists. He, he's one season where he did have that top 100 run, which I think he was like 98th or something in that time. It was because he got 1.2 steals. That's what he can bring. But he really offers very little else. Is he taking minutes away from McCall Bridges? Is he taking them away from Josh Jackson, who is starting to look good now? Is it Oubre? Is it Warren? That's the real issue. So I do not think that Tyler Johnson is a must-add player. He is a guy that we take streamer, flyer type situations on. He's in a better situation than where he was in Miami, but still the propensity or the possibility that he actually plays fewer minutes because he was starting and playing like 30 minutes a game at times in Miami, and then he'd play 22. But in Phoenix, he might not get that level of play. And again, if they want to play him as a point guard, that is a terrible, terrible decision to just con commit long-term to a 30-plus minutes of Tyler Johnson. So I don't see him as a must-roster guy. The Duke, Wayne Ellington, he comes across. He won't play a game for Phoenix. He'll be waived, and he'll join another team where he becomes that three-point streamer for deeper leagues, whether that's the Raptors, whether it's the Lakers, although the Lakers have got KCP, Josh the Hitman Hart, and Reggie Bullock. So finding a spot there without another trade from the Lakers makes that a tough sell. Uh, Philadelphia would be a good spot for him. Maybe he fits in uh, Milwaukee, or they're probably not a, a good roster spot there. Oklahoma City would be good for Allington as well to come in and play those minutes that Alex Abrines was supposed to take but had, had his issues with. So he's not really going to have too much of an impact there. On the Miami side of things, I don't expect much out of Ryan Anderson. We've got our centers, Hassan Whiteside and Bam Adebayo. Bam! For the time being, we've got our power forwards, Jim Johnson and Kelly Olynyk. So where's Anderson fit in there? This is just a tax, a money-saving move for the Heat. Anderson's not going to play. But what it does is it takes Tyler Johnson out of the rotation. It doesn't take Wayne Ellington out of the rotation because Wayne Ellington wasn't in the rotation. But it takes Tyler Johnson out, and it gives Miami a much more succinct and common sense -y type rotation. So we're going to get more minutes from Dion Waiters. I think that's almost a guarantee. But Waiters is not a must-roster player. He's a guy, again, whose best season was the 120th ranked player two seasons ago. Uh, he's better for points leagues than rotisserie type formats or head-to-head -head leagues. He will get some assists here in this in this scenario, but then Dragic returns, and that's going to have an impact. So if you're going to look at Waiters, maybe he has short-term value as a points league guy or a 14-team league player, but not a player I'm scurrying to the wire to go and grab because he just doesn't have the best fantasy profile, not good field goal percentage, poor free throw percentage, doesn't get steals, a terrible rebounder, and it's not like he's going to be coming out and scoring 20 points per game as he recovers from that ankle injury, which has basically cost him two seasons. 
Does it help anyone else? Maybe it gives a little bit of stability to Justice Winslow, but he is really who he is. We've talked about him in yesterday's show about how he has declined or actually just settled in to be the player that he is, and that's the sort of value that he's at. And it just gives, again, more st stability to guys like Dwayne Wade uh, and, and Winslow and probably a little bit more stability in that front court as well, where we've got guys who have got fairly solid roles. I don't think it changes anything for Scooter Magruder. We're not adding him. I don't expect him to be a part of the rotation. In fact, he's just as likely to be dealt as anyone else. The most inconsequential trade of the day, I've just got to mention it because it happened. Malachi Richardson goes from the Raptors to the Sixers. The Sixers do need you know, wing and bench, and bench guard play. Richardson's not the answer, and even if he is, he's not a good fantasy player. So that is, for those of you in 78-team leagues, maybe Malachi can have an impact there. Let's go to the next big deal of the day, though. The old tongue twister, the Porter Porters Parker deal for the Chicago Bulls and the Washington Wizards. Um, on the surface, I went, "Oh shit!" The uh, the Bulls that they they made a good move, but then I look at it and go, "Did they? Did they actually make a good move for Otto Porter, who is best suited as a complementary type player, not as a guy who's leading a young rebuilding squad who's owed you know fifty six million dollars over the next two seasons after this one." I don't really value Jabari Parker all that much, but turning him into Otto Porter on the surface looks good. Punch Bob Shiplock, I think he's significantly overrated, and now you don't have to pay him as a restricted free agent. But was he going to command as much as what uh, what Porter is commanded? Well, Porter is already owed at this point. Probably not. And if you gave him that much, you'd be crazy as a Oh, shit, it is, you are crazy as a front office. It is a Chicago Bull, so that probably would have happened. So in the end, I look at it and go, yeah, that, that makes sense. But they did also, the Bulls, just spend that first-round pick that they got for uh, Nikola Marotic off the Pelicans on Chandler Hutchison, who, before the toe injury, was starting at small forward. So have they given up on that? Let's see what Dunn, Levine, uh, Markin, and Hutchison combination can do. That's a worry. But in saying that, have they thought, we want Lowry Markin to be our full-time starting center? Because at the moment, it's Chris Felicio and Robin Lopez. For, by full-time, I mean rest of the season. Of course, Wendell Carter Jr. moves in there. So do we get Porter moving across to the four and we get Hutchison starting alongside him at the three? Markinen's rim protection and defense at center is a real issue. Of course, that's not going to be his long-term position because of Wendell Carter around. So there's still some confusion around here with this. Uh, and I like the idea from the Wizards, the John Wall injury. I talked about that yesterday or the day before that I think this might have accelerated. Or no, I don't think. It definitely accelerated their idea of trying to blow it up. We'll talk about them a little bit more later uh, when we look at some of the... Actually, let's talk about it all now with the Wizards. And then you see they, they traded away Markeith Morris to the Pelicans. Oh, they're getting out of it. And then the report comes out, they're not looking to move Trevor Ariza. They're not looking to move Jeff Green. And they're not looking to move Bradley Beal. So they've given away this season. Kelly Oubre and Otto Porter, two young wings on this team. And they're going to build around Trevor Ariza and Jeff Green. That makes absolutely no sense whatsoever to try and bring back Ariza and Green while trading these other guys away. Uh, I don't value Port uh, Parker is just a, an expiring deal that gets them uh, saves them some money this season. He's not going to be coming back, uh, Jabari. Uh, and then Portis, what are you going to pay him? What's his position? So let's have a look at how this works. Wes Johnson came across in that Markeith Morris deal. So let's have a look at the Washington scenario straight away. What it does do for Bobby Portis, now, so much of this is up in the air about what happens with Dwight Howard as well. Now, Thomas Bryant... A lot of, oh, does this mean we have to add Thomas Bryant back? And it's it's confusing because Bryant put up a really strong performance today. But prior to today, today he was playing 17 minutes a night without Dwight Howard and without Markeith Morris. And yes, Markeith Morris won't be coming back, but Portis and Parker, they'll be in the rotation. Green's still there. You lost Otto Porter? Sure. So you lost Otto Porter, Jeff Green takes his minutes. Jabari Parker steps into Jeff Green's old role. And that means Bobby Porter steps into Markeith Morris's role. And then where does that leave Bryant then? And then if Howard does come back, where the hell is uh, where the hell is Bryant then? I like Bryant. I've been critical of the way Brooks has used him this season, but I do really worry about how they're going to be or where these minutes are going to be. Is an upside flyer type guy, but again, without Markeith, without Howard, he's been getting 18 minutes a night, which is nowhere near enough to be a consistent guy. And then they added two more forwards into that mix while, of course, removing uh, Otto Porter and Markeith, who, again, wasn't part of the, the recent rotation. So Portis is, is, a, is not a good real-life player. He sucks defensively. He doesn't pass. He can have efficiency issues. But I think he's a top 100 guy. And I think he still retains his value as a must-roster 12-team league guy. As for Jabari, again, lots of, is he a must-add guy? I don't see it. 
I, I don't see him getting the 30 plus minutes a night he's going to need to be that must roster guy. I see mid 20s for him. Another guy that, like Portis, does not get you any defensive numbers, has subpar efficiency numbers, doesn't hit threes at a big rate, doesn't get assists. He needs 30 plus to be that guy, and I just don't see him getting it. I see Green. I see uh, I see Portis. I see Howard, I see Bryant, I see Parker. It's just too many guys mixed in there for Jabari to come in and demand 30 for a guy who almost assuredly will not be on this team next season. So that's the change there in um, in Washington. Thomas Satoransky, I think his value is solidified. And hopefully, hopefully, Brooks just continues to give him the minutes that he needs. And Brad Beal won't be getting traded as well. So his value should stay relatively consistent. Um. Let's go on to the Chicago side of this deal. Of course, this opens up a ton in Chicago because who are the centers? Robin Lopez and Chris Felicio are your only centers at the moment because Carter's out with that thumb injury. Do we play more Markinen there? Perhaps. I think this is a boost for uh, Markinen, for Dunn, and for Levine because Portis was an absolute usage uh, vacuum. So shots are going to go to their better players, which might help them and actually might worsen their draft pick um, because of the, the uh, better players having the ball in their hands. And of course, Porter moves in, plays 30 plus minutes as you're starting small forward now. And hopefully, with there was clear issues with Porter in Washington this season. Clear. I don't know if it was Dwight Howard dropping too many farts on his head. I don't know what happened with him and Scott Brooks, but there was issues. So hopefully, we can get more of Porter's uh, efficiency back. Now, he had taken on a larger offensive role in Washington and was hurting his usage, hurting his efficiency. But in Chicago, even though they're terrible, Markinen, Dunn, and Levine will all get that usage that Porter was absorbing in Washington. So hopefully, it allows him to go back to being that lowish usage, low-scoring fantasy beast by contributing and having that high efficiency. I've got pretty decent hopes for Porter here, uh, just with this new role in Chicago, and hopefully out of whatever toxicity was happening in Washington can help him. Of course, Wayne Seldon and Chandler Hutchison, who'd been moonlighting as starting small forwards, their value just got pissed on pretty heavily here. Uh, Robin Lopez, is he a must roster guy? Sure, if you're in a 16 or 18 team league, he could of course be getting traded tomorrow. I get the feeling he won't be traded and I want to keep him around as part of the leadership committee that they seem to be trading everyone out of at this point. Uh, Portis, which was always nonsense to put him into that group to begin with, he is gone. I think Lopez might stay. Uh, he is not a highly useful fantasy guy in general. And I don't think we should be wasting too many resources to get him onto the squad. So some, some big losses in value where Selden had that short-term value. Hutchison was coming into his own before the injury. Um, but yeah, Porter, uh, Porter, Porter, not not Punch Bob, Porter can get some of his uh, value back, hopefully in Chicago. Hello, darkness, my old friend. The next trade was a three-way deal. We had Iman Shumpert go from Sacramento to the Houston Rockets. We had Alec Burks and a second-round pick go from Cleveland to the Sacramento Kings, and Houston sent a protected first-round pick to the Cavs along with Marquise Chris and um, the guy that completely are uh, Brandon Knight. The Cavs also sent back Source Castillo and Wade Baldwin back to the Rockets. So we can forget Stauskas, we can forget Baldwin. They're just not going to play in Houston. I think, don't think there's any worry uh, with those guys heading across there. Uh, Burks was taking like a 30-plus minute a roll in Cleveland. Uh, that's cooked as he goes to Chicago. So Brandon Knight gets an opportunity now to have an increased role. Now, he has not been good at all in the limited minutes he's had in Houston. And even before his injury in Phoenix, he was struggling. So I wouldn't say that he is a must-roster guy. Ahead of him, you've still got names like Colin Sex and David Nawaba. Uh, you've got uh, Jordy Clarkson there as well, who's going to get minutes. And Kevin Love's return is getting pretty close. So, you know, Marquis Chris, is he a guy you're going to take? Someone that listen to this is going to take a flyer on Marquis Chris. That's someone's going to be wrong, but they're going to take a flyer on Chris because, again, yeah, who's he got ahead of him? Nance, Zizic, Love, Thompson, Osman, when he plays the power forward. Shit, even Jerome Blossom game and Denga Dell are probably Australia's own Denga Dell are probably better options than Chris at this point. So he's going to get the occasional moment, but he doesn't just walk into a wide open role where Nance, Love, Thompson, Zizic are all pretty clearly ahead of him in that front court. Um, 
In terms of, you know, Burks moving out, I think it does help Chetty Osman a little bit, who before that ankle injury was putting up some really strong numbers. It helps Geordie Clarkson, who is an interesting 12-team league add. A switch from Burks to Clarkson, if that's the way you wanted to roll, would make more sense now at this point. So he gets a little bit of, of a boost in value in this situation. But the Cavs rotation is one of the more confusing ones in the NBA with, I don't know, who, who's going to start at shooting guard? Are they going to put Clarko there? Is Nwaba going to start at shooting guard? Are they going to go weird and put Brandon Knight there? Are there other moves coming? Almost definitely there's other moves coming. They've been really good in acquiring assets, so shout out to them for getting those assets. But this team at the moment is an absolute disaster. On the court, they're terrible. And figure, figuring out this rotation and whatever Larry Drew is going to do with it, it can be pretty confusing. Now on Houston, Shumpert likely moves into the role again that James Ennis was playing. I think there's a legitimate ch chance that Shumpert comes in and starts over Eric Gordon, like they were doing at the beginning of the season when Ennis was in that role and Gordon coming off the bench, like Trevor Ariza started last season. I think that can happen. Does that make Shumpert a must roster player? God, no. It makes him an interesting threes and steals type streamer, a 16-team league guy, maybe a 14-team league player with occasional bursts of 12-team league value. He might play more minutes in, in Houston than Sacramento. That's a realistic possibility because he has really played well uh, through Sacramento this season. Been really, really impressive what Shumpert's done this season, but he's not the greatest of fantasy producers, of course. So he's putting up some strong numbers at the moment. It's going to hurt Gerald Green. It's going to hurt James Ennis. It's going to hurt Austin Rivers. And I think it does move Gordon to the bench. Gordon's issue is always, is Chris Paul and James Harden healthy? If the answer is yes, then his value is probably not there for 10 and maybe 12 team leagues. If if one of Harden or Paul is out, then Eric Gordon does become a 12 team league guy and Shumpert is a ring a rung below that. On the Sacramento side, we've got to tie this in with another trade that went down today. They did ship off Iman Shumpert. They also shipped off Justin Jackson and Zach Randolph. And in comes Alec Burks and, of course, the pencil Harrison Barnes. I thought Burks would have a, a chance at getting that role that Shumpert had, not the starting role, but his minutes. And Bogdanovich would come in and play 32 or 33 minutes, and that would be great for Bogey. But with the pencil coming in, he is going to slot into that starting small forward position, I would imagine, unless they want to go weird, and which is probably a better move, putting Barnes at the four and putting Bagley at the five and, and taking Corley Stein out of that rotation. I think the Kings have got more moves coming as well. As for Barnes, he had not been a 12-team league guy for big stretches of this season. I do not think this helps him. I think it probably hinders him again. Yeah, he was losing the touches to uh, Luka Doncic. He was losing rebounds to DeAndre Jordan throughout the season, and it will cause him to struggle. And now he's going to be yeah, fighting for touches for Bagley and Heald and Fox as well. Um, and they're going to get their shots up too. And, and it's going to limit what uh, what Barnsley can do, a guy who gets no assists, steals or blocks, and is inefficient. So I, I think that if he was dropped, he, he's a worthy flyer, but I don't think this makes him a sky-high upside sort of a player. While Bogdanovich, I think it hurts him pretty significantly here. He probably doesn't lose as much value you would say Tobias Harris did in that deal. But Bogdanovich, who was getting you know, 28, 29 minutes off the bench behind Shumpert, well, you'd have to assume that Barnes comes in and plays more minutes than what Shumpert was. Burks comes in and takes the Justin Jackson role now, and I think this does hurt uh, it does hurt Bogdanovich quite a bit. As for Burks, he went from a 12-team fringe guy to maybe a 20-team fringe guy, in my opinion, and his value drops off. I also think it hurts Nemanja Bielitsa a little bit with more flexibility to play Barnes at the four and, uh, and and have Bagley there at the five. That's a, an extra guy to take minutes away from Bielitsa, who played quite well today, but I think it's going to have a real impact on what his value is going to be. So that was a, a weird sort of trade, an out-of-the-blue trade, especially considering Barnes was in the middle of the game when that news came down, and that was pretty uh, It was pretty rough to see. Because I think Harrison Barnes, as much as I don't like him as a fantasy player, I think he's one of the best blokes in the entire NBA. I, I, I should do a best bloke rating from my limited interaction or knowledge of this, this stuff with this, of these guys. I think he's a top 5% bloke in the NBA, just an absolute ripper of a guy, and you feel sorry for him, but he handled it well. He handled it with class. He just seems like an absolute top bloke. Let's look at Dallas now, who is really, really blowing it up. Of course, uh, Tim Hardaway Jr. came in today, but their, their rotation is pretty weird, and Rick Carlisle said he's going to be pretty flexible and have lots of, lots of lineup decisions, which is terrible for us for a, from a fantasy point of view, but I do think this move from Barnes, it does make things a little bit more clear. What it does do 
is I don't think Zach Randolph is going to play. They did waive Salah Mejri today, so he's not going to be a part of the rotation. It looks like they're going to be buying out Zach Randolph as well. And Justin Jackson just isn't good. But I think Jackson is going to have to play a relatively significant role here unless they want to get Ryan Brokoff in playing some more. So they'll at least want to see what they get from Jackson. What I think this does do is it locks in Jalen Brunson and it locks in Dorian Finney-Smith as probably 30-minute-a-night guys now, and that was going to be a struggle for them beforehand. Tim Hardaway made his debut, didn't play 30 today, but I think that boosts him. Now, is Brunson and Finney-Smith must-roster guys? They're not that good as fantasy players. Brunson can be that assist-type streamer at a 12-team league. I think Finney-Smith is a must-roster 14-team league guy, but we've seen stretches of him starting before where it hasn't necessarily resulted in good fantasy numbers. But with the removal of Barnes... From this, and I think yeah, the question is going to be you know, who starts at power forward. It's going to be Doncic now that, that's back to being the power forward on this team. And you're going to get the starting lineup of Brunson, Hardaway, Finney Smith, Doncic, and uh, Maxi Kleber. Maybe you get Dwight Powell in there occasionally, but I think this helps Powell. I think it helps Kleber. We saw the, both of those guys' minutes jump really far up today, and I think there's a legitimate chance with almost 0% confidence, but a legitimate, a legitimate chance that both of those guys are top 100 guys the rest of the way out. We saw what Powell can do today with his defensive numbers and field goal percentage. We know what Kleber can do with blocks and threes and being just a generally good player. And I think this helps them gain those two to three extra minutes that they need to be solid. As for Justin Jackson, he is just not a good fantasy player at all. He's a worse version of Harrison Barnes, someone who scores and does it efficiently one out of five games and does almost literally nothing else. So he is not really an option here. So the value bump there is Powell and Kleber, and they're probably two of the biggest winners from this entire uh, day of, of trades. Brunson gets a boost. Finney Smith gets somewhat of a boost as well. Well, Doncic, there's a chance he's a top 20 guy when all is said and done. From here on out, interestingly today, Courtney Lee wasn't a part of the rotation for the Dallas Mavericks. And the last one is one that we just have no idea. And that is the New Orleans Pelicans acquiring Markeith Morris, who I think there's a real chance that he doesn't play again this season. I don't know that for sure, but I think that's a real chance. Uh, acquired for Wes Johnson. Julius Randle came back today. We don't know what Mirotic is going to do. Tone Davis, I... Uh, and I've you know, been going back and forth on this quite a bit with Anthony Davis. I don't think he is traded tomorrow. Thursday, whatever day he listens. I don't think he's traded by the deadline. And I also think he will play again for the Pelicans. He is adamant that he will, he wants to play. And I think if a team yeah, holds him out against his will in that regard, in, I've got lots of thoughts on this whole scenario, which I don't want to get too deep into here. Uh, there's going to be problems um, for him. But uh, the report from uh, Brian Windhorst, uh, all the, the, the discussion he had with Rachel Nichols, I believe, talking about the Pelicans engaging the Lakers in these trade offers to include all of their young players just for the sole purpose of destabilizing that franchise with absolutely zero interest in ever actually executing a trade with them. Uh, that's pretty shit. If that's actually true, if not, and not them, yeah, not I'm not talking about them leaking the names or yeah, that's the business. That's part of it. If they literally had no interest in a trade and they just did this to piss off the Lakers, and I understand wanting to piss off the Lakers because it, it it can be frustrating with all their posturing and and I'm sure tampering that goes on all the time. If this was their petty way of getting back, um, no problem with doing it to the organization. No issue at all. But I feel really bad for these blokes, Kuzma and Ingram and Hart and um, Lonzo. I feel bad for them because it's really, really shit. And we saw them get their asses absolutely destroyed yesterday uh, in that game because it's clearly impacting them. And that, that is a shit thing to do if that is what happened and what Windhorse reported is correct. And the fact that they did it solely to you know, destabilize and, and really just screw with the lives of these young kids, uh, that's pretty shit. Again, assuming that's correct, and they had no interest in actually engaging with the Lakers uh, in a trade. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. I guess we'll see how this all pans out over the next uh, 12 hours or so. As for Mar it's just impossible to know. Are they going to move Marotic? Are they going to move Etuan more? I think Jolly Okafor's value, we saw him already drop off today with Randall playing. I think he's in, in real trouble, and he's not going to be that 12-team league guy as we move forward. Kenrick Williams is an interesting one, but where does Morris fit in? You could make the argument that Markeith Morris comes into this team as the fifth best big man on this team. Davis, Marotic, Randall. Do you put Okafor ahead of him? Do you put Kenrick Williams? You probably don't. Do you put Okafor? Maybe. So at best, he's the fourth best big man on this team dealing with a neck injury. He's not going to have any sort of 12-team league value, 14-team league value, 
16 team league value. I think there's a real chance that from here on out, he's not even a top 200 player, Markeith Morris, and may not even be a part of this rotation. I think that's a real concern for Markeith, who had already shown pretty significant signs of slippage so far this season. So I think just covers all of the deals that went down today, just wild shit happening, and I expect more of that to go down tomorrow. Now, let's actually talk about the games that went down across the, uh, across the NBA um, with, uh, in Wednesday's action, go through those, uh, those games, break them down. The first game that we take a look at, as my head pops up on the screen before the box score, that's always disconcerting. The first game we look at was the, old, uh, was the Brooklyn Nets. They, uh, they took on the Denver Nuggets and they beat them 135 to 130. Malone was not happy with the effort from the Nuggets. It's a big win for the Nets to be able to get that. Paul Millsap and Gaz Harris were both out. Nice, Gary! So Mason Plumley started and he was great again. And this might seem weird. I, is Mason Plumley a better player than Paul Millsap at this point, or at least a better fit? in that front court because Millsap struggled and Plumlee has played well nearly every time he's got that opportunity to start with Jokic. Really good from him. 24 and 6 with three blocks. Jokic triple doubled and Jamal Murray, the blue arrow, he was back. 32 minutes, 19, 3 and 11. Awesome to have him back. Of course, with him back, Monty Morris lost playing time. Still 28 minutes for Morris, 18, 5 and 5. And Malik Beasley had 17 points with, of course, his now traditional nothing else in 32 minutes and he is going to lose a lot of value. I was worried about Farton Will Barton heading into this season. Uh, I was even more worried when he had a significant hip injury, and he has been really bad these last couple of games, like really bad. He's not a droppable guy, but in two weeks' time, we could very well still be at this situation where he's barely a top 100 or top, sorry, barely a top 180 player, and you have to think about moving on. I thought it was always going to be hard for him to fit into this team in that starting lineup in particular, and he was, he was just terrible. Three points in 19 minutes for Farton. Will Barton today was not good at all, as Malik Beasley and Monty Morris both clearly outplayed him. For the Nets, Shabazz Napier, another 27 minutes, 10 points and 11 assists. It's great, but again, value opening up here at the deadline. Napier is one of those guys that goes, along with, say, a Jaleel Okafor, if no trade happens with the, the Pelicans. Like, these are the guys that their value can Fareed, another one who was great again, but in two weeks' time, like, their value is done. And I think that's going to happen with Napier. Damari Carroll turned the clock back. 18, 10, and 6 with four steals. Strong from him, even with the blue swimmer, Alan Crabb back. But of course, Levert, Dinwiddie, and Dudley are all going to be returning. And that's going to have an impact on Carroll. It already had an impact on Rowdy Rodion's Kurooks, who played only 17 minutes. Well, the blue swimmer, he was back. 13 points for Alan Crabb. Uh, sorry, 13 minutes, five points. Jarrett Allen, only 24 minutes. A little bit disappointing. He's going to be... Um, yeah, he's going to be better for this in, in the future. Uh, it's been a little bit of a rough run. Also, a big shout out to Trevion Graham, who had 16 points on nine shots. Of course, his, uh, his value and his role is very much up for debate when Jared Dudley returns. The next game we take a look at, we've got the Washington Wizards and the Milwaukee Bucks. No, we don't, because we've got uh, the uh, other game up here, the New Orleans Pelicans and the Chicago Bulls. That is the one. That we're going to look at now. Randall was back 31 minutes, 31 and 7 with three assists. He also hit four triples. So big from him to come back from that ankle injury. Really, really strong. While my man checked Diallo, 18 and 9 with a block. I really believe in Diallo, but adding Markeith Morris, like where is he going to play now? He's not going to get minutes with, with everyone healthy. Moving on from a couple of guys would help. Apparently, the Pel Pelicans aren't interested in moving on from Julius Randle, so it's going to just be more time uh, on the shelf for Diallo. Kendrick Williams, 12-7. and seven. He had two blocks. He had two triples. He's been a real fantasy stud these last couple of games. Is he better than Ian Clark, Darius Miller, Solomon Hill? Yes, yes, yes. Is he better than Etwan Moore? Maybe. Maybe there's a role from him, but he has been super impressive, and he is worth holding in a lot of cases. While Okafor, I touched on earlier, 13-5 and five in 25 minutes, and that's the red flag there, the 25 minutes. A real worry for his value moving forward when two other superior big men are going to have to re-enter this rotation. For the Bulls, Markin and 30 and 10 in 41 minutes with Punch Bob out. Fantastic. No blocks, no steals. That's always the limit to his uh, upper ceiling, I believe. While Chrissy Dunn, 18, 4 and 8 with two steals. Strong from Dunny. While Zach Levine had 28, 8 and 7 on some pretty high usage taking on those Porter shots. Shaq Harrison, big Shaq, four steals, four assists, and a block. He's going to lose those 26 minutes to Otto Porter. While Saldo, Wayne Seldon, five fouls, limited him to 20 minutes, but his value is uh, about to be shitted on. Robin Lopez played 29 minutes, 11 and three in two blocks. And that might help you here and there. Think of it in him as a worse Cody Zeller. And that's more of that 14 or 16 team league guy with a lot more uncertainty uh, about his overall value. The uh, next game that we take a look at here, 
Hopefully it's the game that I talked about earlier. There is the Washington Wizards and the Milwaukee Bucks. The Bucks smacked them 148, 129, of course. Porter was held out before the game. No punch, Bob. No Jabari Parker yet on this squad. So Tom Bryan, I referenced it earlier. 32 minutes for Tom, 26 and 14, a triple and two blocks. And this is why I've talked him up so much. That I love what he can do. A massive fantasy uh, strength uh, of his. He, he's a really strong fantasy performer. Just the minutes aren't there because before this game, 12 minutes, yuck, 18 minutes, 19 minutes, 23 minutes, and nowhere near that production. And then the game before that, 30, and then 20, then 21, then 26, then 16. It's really hard to get a full grasp on the minutes here. Even the last time he played against Milwaukee, he played only, uh, only 24 minutes, and now he played 32. And that's strong from Tom. It's really strong numbers. And when the minutes come, he'll put them up. But the addition of Portis, the eventual alleged return of Dwight Howard, where are those minutes going to come from? I think he's still probably worth holding in a lot of cases, but I think uh, I think we need to have a, uh, a bit of an understanding that, that it could really blow up. Jeff Green. My name is Jeff. 22 points, five triples, three assists and a block. I think he's going to have a relatively solid role as we move forward here, not going to be moved. So he has that fringe 12 team value as I touched on, and that's you know, strong from him. Well, Sadoransky had 16, 7, and 10, while Ariza wasn't his best night. The eight assist is pretty weird, but uh, five points and two steals for Big Trevor. Jordy McRae, unsurprisingly, the shooting and scoring wasn't able to keep up. He had nine points in 19 minutes, but this team still needs guards, so he could find himself with a decent enough role long term. Antero Kumpo, 31 minutes. I talked about this yesterday. There was a real risk that nobody would play over 30 minutes apart from Yanni, and that's exactly what happened. They had 50 points in the first quarter here, the Bucks. 43, 6, and 4 in with three steals in 31 minutes for Antero Kumpo is amazing. The free throws are a disaster there, though. Uh, 6 of 11. Bledsoe, 22, 6, and 11 with two steals in 27 minutes. And keep an eye on him. His name has been floated in trades. Don't be shocked if he is moved. Middleton, 16, 2, and 5, while Brogdon, 18, 2, and 5, and Lopez didn't need to do too much in this game, just the 22 minutes, as this was a real uh, a real smacking by the Bucks over the Wizards. Next up, the Hornets and the Mavericks. The Mavericks win 99, 93. The Hornets still apparently re-engaging on Marc Gasol, so things could really be changing on this team. Kemba had 30, 11, and 6 with two steals. That's good. And I think we've got to talk about Nick Batum, not just because he had a Richie Benno. Two for two, two, two. But the performances from him lately have been better. 14 points, five assists, plus that Richie Benno. That's enough for a 12-team league. And he is you know, fine to add. His upside's probably limited, well, definitely limited. But that's enough to be interested. Cody Zeller also, 9-13 and 13 in 25 minutes. It's, it's good. But I, I just I worry about what's going to happen here. If he stays and Gasol's there, what happens if he goes to Memphis? There's a lot of uncertainty, and he's not a high upside guy. Uh, Devontae Graham backed up uh, Kemba Walker because Tone Parker was out, while Biombo struggled as a starting center. Malik Monk's been trashed the last couple of games. If you're holding him, you hold him at least one more day, and we see where that goes. For the Mavericks... No Harrison Barnes for the second half of the game. He played 26 minutes and was his usual terrible self. 10 points off 13 shots. But let's talk about the positives there. Dorian Finney-Smith, 15 and 10. 64% shooting, not realistic for Dorian, but enough. Now, he's rostered in 3% of leagues. That should be higher than that. He should be rostered in all 16 teamers, and you can make an argument in 14 teamers. My man, Dwight Powell, 11 and 12 in 27 minutes, two steals and two blocks. Now, the Mavericks could be trading anyone literally at this point outside of Doncic or Porzingis. But uh, Powell, that's that's what he can do. That's the damage he can do. And with Barnes gone, that should tack an extra two to three minutes onto his value. Maxi Kleber, 29 minutes, 11 and seven with a steal. Really strong value. Well, Doncic had his third triple-double, 19, 10, and 11. Only four teenagers in the NBA have had a triple-double. Sorry, there's only been four triple-doubles by teenagers. Doncic has had three, and the other one, Markel Fultz. Timmy Hardaway, 26 minutes in his Mavericks debut, 12 and 4, a steal, a block. He should be rostered if he was dropped, while uh, Brunson had those 30 minutes, 8, 7, and 5 with two steals. So hardly anything spectacular, but the two steals, the five assists, that's useful. While Trey Burke was the uh, the weird 10th man in this rotation, just the four points for Berkey. The next game, a blowout, the Jazz 116, the Suns 88. McCall Bridges, he brought us value and didn't score. Nine points, one three, two assists, two steals, one block. This is what he does. He played 40 minutes, and that's going to come down with Tyler Johnson arriving. Ubre had 16, 4, and 3, and surprisingly didn't start despite Melton, Booker, and Warren all being out. They went with Dragon Bender for God knows what reason at power forward. Ubre was strong, 
Aiton had 29, and Rashawn Holmes. I know there are a lot, lot of people and people that are, you know, who's and I appreciate many different opinions on fantasy basketball. I know, you know, guys like Aaron Bruskin and Dan Besbris are really big on holding Rashawn Holmes. I just don't, I don't believe it. I, I don't buy it. I find it hard to hold a guy who plays 18 minutes a night despite some of his big performances that he has. I just don't think you're getting consistent enough value. Those guys think differently, and that's totally fine because I'm wrong about stuff you know, often, as everyone is, because you're never going to be right on 100% of things. But if I had Holmes and I have him in a couple of formats uh, and value opened up, Dwight Powell, Maxi Kleber, I'd happily make those moves because I feel better about those guys playing 27, 28 a night than I do with Holmes playing 18 minutes. I think Jamal Crawford is out of the rotation now with Tyler Johnson arriving. But the Jazz... Uh, a blowout, so minutes were a little bit reduced. And we also got 27 Royce O'Neal minutes, 15 uh, with four assists and two, two steals for O'Neal. Not someone we need to pay too much attention to. Gobert had three steals and three blocks, as well as a double-double while the Don. Donovan Mitchell. He's Don. He's good. Uh, 21 points on 21 shots is not good. Uh, not much else there for him. It wasn't his uh, best performance while Derek Favors started again. The next game, the Rockets with a blowout win over the Kings, 127-101. Talked about hard and talked about green. Ken Farid, 30 minutes, 13 and 11, two blocks and a steal. Capella's going to come back. Farid's going to be the backup, and he's probably going to play max 18 minutes, maybe 16 minutes a night, and it's not going to be enough to hold on to. So if you're looking at playoffs, if you're not in a scrappy battle for spotty, spot, not spotting, for getting into a spot now, then he becomes expendable as you look forward to the future. Eric Gordon, 20 points in 22 minutes. The, the limited minutes are a bit of a concern as he comes back from knee soreness. But again, this game was a blowout, so he wasn't needed. And I don't think that he's going to be a must-roster guy necessarily. For the Kings, Bogdanovich, 13-4-3, three, three steals and a block. That's great, although Barnes now comes in and really impacts him. While Bialitsa, a nice October throwback, 15-6 and six in 25 minutes, while Marvin Bagley had 10-10 and 10 and Harry Giles, 14-7. and seven. So strong games from the Sticky Bandits. Uh, Bagley's the 12-team league guy you want to add. And I said, I do believe something's going to happen with uh, Cauley Stein in this team, and that could really open things up for Hazard. So check out Giles, maybe just as a watch list, keep an eye on that. Darren Fox struggled, six points in 29 minutes. The last game of the night, there is almost nothing to talk about because the Spurs got pumped by the Warriors, 141-102. Interestingly, Popovich decided to rest DeMar DeRozan and LaMarcus Aldridge, but he also took Bryn Forbes out of the starting lineup for Paddy Mills and Marco Ballinelli to start. Now, you know that I'm not the biggest fan of Forbes. He played only 9-10 minutes, and there is nothing to take out of this game because the minutes are spread. The rotation makes no sense. I will talk about Lonnie Walker, though, who was bad. 26, and not, not to shit on the bloke, but 26 minutes, 4 points, 0 of 10 from the field. That's really, really poor. It's tough, though, in your first extended minutes against this Warriors team with your two best players out, maybe even three of your best four players out. It was always a tough scene for him. For the Warriors, Kevin Durant had an absolute explosion at the media after the game. Shout out to you, Kev, because, man, just calm down. Uh, 23, 8, and 9 with three steals. Thompson, 26 points with six assists. Steph had 19, 5, and 7, and nobody was required to play big minutes. The only big news to come out of this from the Warriors is that Steve Kerr said about DeMarcus Cousins, You can call me Coach Steve. Sorry, Coach Steve said that he will keep DeMarcus Cousins limited to 25 minutes until the All-Star break, and then after that we get him ramped to 27 and 30 minutes a night. So that's really the only thing to come out of this game because it was just an absolute massive, massive ass kicking by the Golden State Warriors. All right, let's uh, let's now just, uh, yeah, we're going to wrap it up now, because I'm not doing DFS for tomorrow because of the, all the uncertainty. We will be doing that live show for trades. There'll be plenty of trade talk, and there's the instant reaction stuff, which we're going to do in the live show, and then there'll be a more a thought out and talk about stuff um, and really try and dig into what goes down, and that'll happen later in the day as well as part of the regular show. So subscribe on YouTube so you don't miss the live show. Follow me on Twitter at RedRock underscore B-Ball and check out the rest of the Locked On Podcast Network at Locked On NBA Net. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Jabari Parker.